start off this morning talking about uh, some of the, the segments. Uh, IoT is, of course, a very broad market, so uh, I want to walk through some of the different uh, segments of the market, and uh, then I'll be talking about some technology trends, and, uh, and then wrapping up. So, uh, as I said, the Internet of Things you know, covers a lot of ground, and um, some people uh, uh, look at it as, as kind of the whole embedded market, really, because it, as soon as you add any sort of connectivity uh, to an embedded device, it becomes an IoT device. So, uh, so you can take a car, make it a connected car, you can take a thermostat, make it a smart thermostat, uh, by adding that connectivity feature, and um, now you've got an IoT device. So. Uh, we're seeing a lot of opportunities there. Um, there's uh, IoT clients then uh, that uh, connect through into the, the network, um, often through an IoT gateway. So an IoT gateway can just be maybe a, a broadband uh, interface uh, uh, box, but it has some extra capabilities to deliver services. It may have some extra uh, wireless capabilities to connect to different kinds of IoT clients. And so you have an IoT gateway that then bridges your device into the internet. And then finally, uh, people also talk about the IoT backend or the services that are in the cloud that can process all of the data coming from these IoT devices and allow people to uh, access their IoT devices remotely. Uh, you, you can also uh, include wearable devices in the IoT. Um, a lot of people consider those to be part of the IoT. And some people even uh, talk about smartphones and tablets and PCs as being part of the Internet of Things or the Internet of Everything, as, as, as Cisco calls it. So, uh, you know, at that point, it really does become everything. So, you know, we prefer to focus more on uh, the newer parts of the market. I mean, we, we understand smartphones and PCs have been around for a long time. Uh, so, so we try to focus more on some of the, uh, the emerging categories here in the Internet of Things. At this conference in particular, uh, we want to, uh, we know there's a lot of IoT conferences out there, and uh, we want to uh, really focus more on the hardware side of things. Um, you know, we will try to put that within the context of uh, building an IoT system, but, uh, but our main focus today is really on hardware design, um, the chips and the systems that uh, serve IoT applications. And so in, in looking at those uh, chips uh, and systems, um, there's really some particular requirements that, that differentiate an IoT device from just uh, a standard embedded device. The connectivity, as I mentioned, is key. So that's usually some kind of wireless connectivity that allows you to put your device onto the internet and then get the benefits of being able to access it remotely. Uh, we also see a trend in that IoT toward bringing down the cost of these systems. So focus on uh, the hardware is going to be on reducing costs, and typically this is going to be done through integration. So putting as many functions as possible onto the main SOC. Uh, power is also a consideration in a lot of uh, IoT devices, not all, but many of them are deployed remotely without line power, so you need to operate off of uh, battery power, and uh, that allows them to be mobile in some cases, so power is, is a concern. Uh, security is, is also a big concern. Uh, we'll be talking about that a lot today. Uh, making sure that the data that's coming from your IoT device is, is secure, that it's not accessible to people that you don't want to access your data, that uh, if your IoT device allows some kind of remote control, that you can't have other people uh, remote controlling your device that you don't want to be controlling it. Uh, as you start getting into the, uh, the, the cloud, though, um, you, the Really, the hardware is not that different. I mean, you just have standard servers running standard uh, IoT, well, you have standard servers running custom software to provide these IoT services. So, you know, there's really not, uh, from a hardware standpoint, a lot to talk about there. So, so our focus today is, is mainly going to be on the IoT client and the IoT gateway, because that's where we see more hardware differentiation. So looking at uh, the IoT clients in particular, um, you know, we can divide them into lots of different categories, but you know, at the top level, uh, we kind of look at them in, in these three main categories. So you have the industrial IoT, uh, where you're talking about deploying devices in, in factories and in farms and in businesses and in, in infrastructure, uh, 
to generally help improve efficiency of some sort of uh, industrial or business process. So, so of course, uh, industrial control devices, uh, smart electric meters where you're trying to improve the efficiency of the grid, uh, smart vending machines, smart parking, um, things that uh, you could deploy on a farm to, to detect moisture or soil content, uh, tracking where your assets are. Uh, these are all things that a, a business uh, or industry would deploy. Um, and then as a second category, you can look more at the consumer side and uh, you know, these are devices that would be deployed in homes or maybe small businesses, small offices. Um, and, and these devices are more focused on uh, providing new services and capabilities than necessarily kind of cost. So, you know, home automation where I can, you know, control things in my home remotely, uh, home security where I can uh, protect my, my home and then be able to access uh, the security capabilities remotely, appliances, uh, cars, things that I already have around the house that I can now put onto the internet and things. And then wearable devices, you know, we, we treat as a, as a third category. Uh, they have some unique characteristics in that, uh, of course, the size and power are much more constrained than in, in, in typical uh, consumer IoT devices. They also uh, have more of a user interface and, and uh, more interaction with the consumer. So uh, things like uh, watches, uh, smart glasses, uh, medical devices that you may wear or even implant in your body would be in, in this wearable category. So uh, in the industrial IoT, you know, we're seeing uh, things take off more quickly. Um, you know, we've already uh, uh, deployed uh, about 300 million uh, smart meters uh, worldwide. Uh, these are helping electric companies manage their grid so that uh, they can uh, reduce the peak load. Uh, for an electric company, is is really worried about the peak load because they have to build enough power plants to service that load. So if you can if you can reduce the peak load, then you're saving a lot of money uh, in not having to build extra power plants. So so this is taken off pretty quickly because there's a very clear uh, and compelling business case for uh, utilities to use the smart meters. Um, you know, smart parking is uh, something that's up and coming, and um, uh, in, in uh, traditional parking, uh, particularly parking garages, uh, oftentimes you can get up to 80, 80 or so percent capacity, and it's very difficult for people to find uh, those last few parking spaces, and so you're, you're really losing out on any revenue from, from those extra parking spaces. Uh, with, with a smart parking capability, you can help guide people to those empty spaces. You can tell people where the uh, empty spaces are. Um, and again, there's, there's an immediate business case there uh, to make this work. And we're already seeing uh, deployment of this in, in uh, parking garages, uh, in airports, uh, certainly around here and other locations. Uh, smart vending machines um, uh, can uh, uh, improve sales by uh, advertising things on the screen. Some of these machines even have cameras so that they can recognize particular, uh, not necessarily a person, but they can say, oh, well, this is a young man. He might like to buy this kind of thing from the vending machine, or maybe, um, you know, this is an older person who might prefer a different kind of product so that they can uh, guide the advertisements uh, to help get people to buy the right stuff or the more expensive stuff. So. Um, again, there's, there's a good business case there. Uh, in farms, uh, you could deploy uh, sensors throughout uh, the, the uh, farm area to uh, detect water. When do I need water so I don't waste water? Uh, uh, fertilizer, I want to only apply fertilizer when I need to. Um, you know, ultimately, this improves crop yields and, and profitability. So you know, these are the kind of things that uh, people are looking at where there's a good business case uh, to, to, to implement these industrial devices. So, you know, the real opportunity here is, uh, is to save money. So if you're a business, um, you want to save money, and, and it's a very simple equation, how much is it going to cost me to install this stuff, how much money am I going to save, and what's the return on investment? So uh, when, you, when you've got something like an uh, electricity company that is uh, spending, you know, millions and millions of dollars on power plants, uh, it's pretty easy that you can get even a small improvement is going to save enough money to justify the installation costs for these kind of devices. Um, you know, you, so you still have to worry about costs. I mean, 
you're looking at the smart meter, you know, maybe initially $100 each, now that's coming down to maybe half of that, um, but, uh, you know, it's not quite as cost-focused as consumer. Uh, you know, you, you can use traditional embedded processors in these types of devices because the uh, bill of materials is a little bit higher. Um, you're really worried about reliability more than, than cost. Uh, you certainly don't want to be going out and replacing these devices all the time. So, um, so they have to be uh, reliable. Um, initially, some of the smart meters were using more uh, transmission of data through the power lines, but now a lot of them are, are just using a cellular modem. It's, it's easy. Um, the the, the uh, data plans are getting fairly inexpensive. So, uh, so that's uh, becoming more common. And you know, in this case, though, uh, in the industrial internet, the volumes may not be that big. Uh, smart meters is, is pretty big, but when you start looking at some of the other segments, I mean, like, for example, all of the vending machines in the world, there's about two million. So smart vending machines, you know, not going to be a huge unit uh, market. But, uh, but the price points can be attractive enough to make the investment worthwhile. In the consumer uh, market, we're seeing an explosion of new devices coming out. I, you see something new every day. I just, uh, yesterday, uh, read about a smart oven that uh, you put the food in and it recognizes what kind of food you put into the oven and it, it calculates the best way to cook it and it has a temperature probe that comes out and sticks into the food. It's great. Of course, it costs $3,000, um, but, you know, that's uh, maybe a sign of things to come. Um, you know, some of the popular things we've seen, the, the Nest thermostat, um, is, is, uh, is out there it's shipping about a million, two million, million units. Um, smart light bulbs uh, that allow you to control the you know, lighting and in, in not just the turning them on and off, but now with these new bulbs, you can change the color and the intensity. Uh, so, um, you know, that's starting to roll out. Um, smart door locks that you can see who's at your door and <coughs> decide whether to let them in or not through your smartphone. Um, security systems where you can monitor what's going on in your house, uh, all kinds of stuff is coming out. Um, all of these devices today are pretty expensive. Um, you know, I've got some examples here, you know, $200, $300, you know, even the light bulb is $80 for a light bulb. Um, so, you know, at these kind of price points, the shipments are not that big. The uh, hope is then over time, you know, those prices will come down and, uh, you know, so uh, with consumer devices, you know, typically you want to hit like a hundred dollar price point, fifty dollar price point. You know, those are kind of the break points in the curve where people start uh, being more willing to, to buy something. Um, and so I think as the, the prices of these devices start to reach those points, you know, we'll see a lot more uh, adoption of these devices. So. The, the goal then is, is to really start bringing, bringing the price down. Um, you can use you know, a microcontroller, typical microcontrollers that have been around for years. A lot of these uh, you know, use ARM uh, processors. And then just stick a, a Wi-Fi chip or something on there to uh, attach to the home network. Uh, Wi-Fi is great for these type of consumer devices. There's no monthly data fee. You know, Wi-Fi chips are really cheap. Um, some people are using other kinds of wireless, uh, Zigbee, uh, Six Low Pan, um, these kind of proprietary uh, uh, protocols that uh, you can uh, connect to remote sensors uh, using very low power um, and then bridge that onto, uh, through, a wi uh, through an IoT gateway that now has access to some of these different protocols. So, so there's different ways to slice up the con uh, consumer market and uh, use some of these different technologies. Uh, we're seeing uh, more connected appliances uh, in the consumer market. Uh, one of the reasons is, is to help the manufacturer, actually. They want to know how are people using uh, their washing machine, how are people using their oven, what kind of new features should I be putting in uh, to my appliances to make them more useful to customers. Uh, instead of running you know, some testing in a lab, now you can actually get real data from the thousands of users on how they use their products. Uh, you can also then uh, use this internet connection for diagnostics. You can notify a customer, hey, your uh, uh, motor and your washing machine is starting to wear down. You might want to think about replacing it soon. And, um, you know, the problem is that, you know, consumers may not be real excited about um, 
giving you know all this data to the the appliance manufacturer you know what's in it for them so um, so I, what we're seeing now is manufacturers wanting to kind of do this themselves you know, you're paying five hundred dollars for a washing machine uh, you can put a, an internet connection in there without really changing the, the, the profit margin that much. So, so the appliance makers are starting to add this capability into their appliances themselves. Now, you know, there are some cases like the smart oven where you know, you're actually offering some kind of service and maybe people are willing to pay for that. Um, so, so there's a couple of different models as to you know, how these appliances are gonna get connected and get smart, um, but uh, you know, I think that we will see more and more uh, connected appliances on the Internet of Things, you know, over the next several years. Um, for wearables, uh, you know, wearables are mainly a consumer item, and so, you know, price is, is really an issue here again. So, uh, and then power, as I mentioned earlier, is, is much more critical for wearables. So now you're looking at uh, something that you want to wear on your wrist, maybe, uh, it has to be very small, it has to be very light, uh, so the battery cannot be very big uh, because of the weight, um, and then you have to run uh, at least all day, if not longer, <coughs> off of a very small battery. So, uh, so power consumption becomes very critical. Um, you know, we're seeing a couple of different kinds of wearables uh, with uh, Android Wear or the, the Apple Watch. Um, you, you typically have a pretty, uh, you know, relatively powerful Cortex-A CPU, uh, probably some kind of GPU in there to drive the screen, and uh, that makes things more complicated, it uses more power. You know, alternatively, we're seeing things like fitness bands that just use a very simple uh, microcontroller to keep the, the cost down, keep the power down, and uh, extend battery life. So, uh, and then for connectivity, uh, a lot of these devices are using Bluetooth because the assumption is that I've got a smartphone in my pocket, I can just connect via Bluetooth into the smartphone, and then from there, I can use the cellular connection to get access to, uh, to anything I need. Uh, but uh, some devices now want to be able to run independently. If I don't have my smartphone, maybe I'm out jogging, I just want to have my fitness band. So, so they may have a cellular connection built in uh, to uh, be able to maintain their connectivity. So we're seeing you know, some different kinds of wearables emerge already. Uh, the fitness bands have kind of been fairly successful uh, initially and uh, allowing people to track their, their health. Um, and you can, you can buy these uh, you know, pretty cheaply nowadays. And uh, if, uh, if, you, if you get the, kind of the knockoff version, then you get down to $20, $15 for some of these things. Uh, we saw about 5 million fitness bands ship last year. Certainly, uh, we'll see considerably more this year. Uh, smart watches, of course, uh, this category has been uh, powered up by the, the Apple Watch introduction. And uh, so we're seeing a lot of interest in there. Um, but again, the price points are very high. I mean, $350 you know, minimum, depending on which version of the Apple Watch you want to buy. Uh, but uh, but at, at the other end of the market, we're seeing you know, very cheap watches being sold in, in China and other places for you know, $50 or less. So, uh, so there's an opportunity there as a, if you can kind of combine the, the functionality of, of like an Android watch or an Apple watch with these lower price points, I, I think there's, there's a big opportunity there. Uh, Smart Glass, um, it's kind of the generic name for Google Glass. Um, allows you to do some pretty cool things in terms of being able to see uh, information superimposed on whatever you're looking at and uh, perhaps give you more uh, information on what you're looking at or, or uh, create uh, images of, of things that overlay uh, the real world. So, um, you know, this is a, you know, Google, <coughs> excuse me, a Google Glass had some problems uh, you know, being accepted, I think, in, in, in the consumer space. We, we actually see a lot of uh, interest now coming in, uh, in industrial vertical applications. And, you know, for example, someone who's uh, delivering packages could have information on uh, being displayed uh, in their uh, glass while they're, you know, using their hands to uh, deliver things. Uh, or a repairman uh, could have a, a, a manual or instructions on what uh, they should be doing uh, while they use their hands to work on something. So, uh, 
So I think there's, there's going to be applications there in these industrial spaces, and then you know, maybe over time, uh, this type of wearable could get back into uh, a consumer environment. Again, though, I mean, in terms of getting this into consumers, cost is going to be key. Uh, so, you know, you definitely need the right price points, $100, $50. Uh, you also need, of course, some reason for people to buy these. And a lot of people now have been reviewing the Apple Watch and coming to the conclusion that there's just not enough uh, capability or reason to, to wear the, the Apple Watch. Um, so, so trying to find the right use case uh, that's going to be compelling to the consumer, uh, whether that's going to, going to be uh, having some kind of notifications and information pop up, being able to screen your calls, being able to access uh, internet information, uh, whatever that is, um, you need to have the right capabilities and they need to be easy to use, uh, which is pretty difficult when you have um, you know, something as small as a watch uh, to use as your user interface. So, uh, uh, so I, I think we're still very early on in the uh, uh, life cycle of these smart watches and as the user interfaces uh, develop over time, as the use cases develop over time, I think Apple is counting on uh, their network of app developers to help find compelling new things to do with your smartwatch. Uh, that will help uh, drive these devices into higher volume. Um, another thing that's uh, been a real problem with initial devices is in battery life. Uh, the Apple Watch uh, barely makes it through a day, depending on how you're using it. Uh, people would like to see multiple days, maybe even weeks, uh, between recharging their, their watch. Um, so uh, really focusing on getting the power down in order to enable this longer battery life is going to be critical. Once we can get the price point down, I think these devices will become uh, more popular. Uh, and I think one, one method that we'll see is phone makers bundling them with their phone. Um, I mean, the smart watch becomes an adjunct to your phone anyway, and uh, you probably want to have a similar interface between your phone and your watch. So if I'm buying a phone, you know, for $400, an high-end phone from Apple or, or Samsung, uh, you know, throwing an, a watch in there maybe for another $50 is, is, is pretty easy. And, and uh, so I can see uh, that kind of bundling uh, driving the smartwatch into the market once you have a compelling you know, use case for it. So I think uh, once uh, we solve some of these initial problems, uh, there'll be a lot of interest in these watches, and, and I'm actually pretty, pretty bullish in terms of, of, of how, how many of these devices you know, that uh, could be sold over the next several years. Um, so we are seeing this dichotomy, though, in, in, in the way the watches are being built. Um, you know, the Apple and, and, and Google are pushing this idea that the, that the watch has to be you know, fairly complicated, it needs to run uh, third-party apps, uh, so uh, it, it needs a sophisticated operating system which requires a more powerful CPU, uh, Cortex-A class that has some memory management, uh, you need a, a graphics accelerator to improve the information that's being displayed on the screen, you need more memory in order to uh, run all of this uh, software, so that of course drives up the cost and it drives up the power, and uh, so that makes the battery life a problem. Now the other way to go is to try to keep things as simple as possible. Uh, use a very simple CPU like Cortex-M class, uh, don't need a GPU, just have simple graphics on the display, you use a real-time operating system that doesn't need all of the memory management, uh, now I can reduce the amount of, of uh, DRAM and, and uh, SRAM in the system, I'm not going to run third-party apps, I'm just going to have some basic functions built into the watch. And if I do all of those things, I can get the cost down, I can get the power way down, and I can now have very good battery life, but you know, I may not be de delivering a compelling experience to the user. So I think people are trying to figure out which of these two paths are going to work, and then maybe ultimately, ideally, uh, we can converge those two paths and get you know, a lot of high-end functions with that very low cost and low power. That's going to be difficult, but I think that's the challenge you know, that we're facing right now in order to, to make a really successful smartwatch. 
So uh, you know if you're building an IoT device, you're going to need some kind of CPU, uh, you're going to need memory uh, to run your software, you're going to need some kind of radio to connect to the internet, uh, you're going to need some kind of analog because you're probably uh, interacting with uh, sensors and um, motors or actuators or something that uh, uh, controls the real world. So uh, if you can get as much of that stuff as possible you know, onto a single chip, you know, now you can start driving the cost and power down. So uh, you, there's several options that you can use. Uh, if you get a, a microcontroller, a traditional microcontroller, you've already got CPU and memory and in many cases uh, some kind of analog interfaces uh, on that single chip. So it makes, uh, makes a fairly well integrated system. You just need to add a second chip to do the, the wireless uh, connectivity. Uh, this is also a nice approach because uh, you can use different wireless chips for different kinds of connectivity depending on whether you uh, want to put this into a system with Wi-Fi or put this into a system with uh, Zigbee or whatever uh, your application might need. Uh, but uh, in order to really get the, the, the maximum amount of, of integration, what we're seeing is, is processors now that uh, integrate the radio as well. So, uh, so the typical combination now is CPU, analog, and radio on one chip, and, and then sometimes the memory is either uh, on a, uh, separate uh, uh, die in the same package, uh, or maybe it's uh, external. So, uh, so you can uh, get everything down again with <coughs> two chips, you know, the, the, the processor and then an external memory chip. Uh, and then of course the ultimate is to put everything on a single chip. Um, I've, I've shown a picture here of a, a chip from MediaTek, uh, which actually you know, combines the CPU, flash memory, SRAM, uh, the uh, analog interfaces and, uh, and uh, a wireless uh, Bluetooth connection, uh, all on a single die. So, um, you know, this is not the most powerful chip in the world, but, um, but MediaTek is kind of showing the capability of combining everything <coughs> together. Um, and I think we'll start to see more and more devices like this that uh, can really, you know, combine everything that you need, uh, either on one chip or in a single package. So, you know, what that means is that uh, you know companies are going to be need to uh, be able to put all of these pieces together um, in their in their portfolio. Uh, there aren't a lot of chip companies out there that really have all of this IP. I mean, this is pretty diverse. Um, you know, CPU. I mean, memory is is a different uh, technology. Uh, radios can be very uh, different. Uh, analog, uh, not everybody's uh, used to doing mixed signal design. Um, so you know, we're, we're expecting to see a lot of IP, uh, licensed IP in the IoT market in order to uh, help companies build the kinds of sophisticated SOCs that are required. Uh, of course, uh, CPU cores, there are a lot of CPU cores that can be licensed. Um, you know, ARM, uh, of course, is kind of the, the obvious choice, but uh, you know, we don't see this as a market where uh, ARM compatibility is required. Um, this is not uh, particularly, uh, you know, if you're not building a watch that runs apps, uh, you know, most of these uh, IoT devices uh, are, are embedded, all of the software is there to start, uh, so you can use any CPU you want, and, uh, you know, so there's a lot of alternatives out there um, to, to ARM, and, uh, you know, we'll be hearing about some of them today that, uh, you know, can uh, serve in the IoT market and meet uh, these very low cost and low power uh, requirements. Um, wireless IP uh, is also available. Um, you know, you may uh, want to license that and combine it with your existing uh, processor. And uh, there's different kinds of uh, uh, protocols that you might need. And so you want to get a, a flexible uh, IP that can handle different wireless protocols and uh, implement that into your chip. And uh, we'll be hearing uh, this morning uh, about uh, some wireless IP. So, uh, and then uh, you may need to work with your foundries uh, on uh, embedded memory. Uh, so, uh, uh, embedded SRAM, embedded flash. Uh, so, uh, you know, flash can be a problem as, as you get down into the lower uh, uh, process nodes, 
Uh, but uh, you know, a lot of these IoT devices don't really need to be in 28 nanometer, 20 nanometer. Um, you know, they, they work perfectly well in you know, 40 nanometer, 55 nanometer. Um, so, uh, so we're seeing a lot more interest now <coughs> in using these older process nodes. Um, but as uh, you know, as the foundries can offer new capabilities, I think we'll see you know an opportunity to move down uh, into uh, into smaller transistors. So uh, power is uh, of course important. So uh, you know we're seeing a lot of focus on how do you reduce power. Um, you know on the wireless connection. Uh, you know what uh, it's, it's transmission is really the biggest the power drain. So you want to <coughs> make sure you're using a protocol that minimizes the transmit time. Uh, minimizes the amount of data you're transmitting, and then also, of course, uh, is a, a protocol that's focused on low power, so it's not wasting power in other ways. So, uh, you know, so that's that's a real focus. Um, and then, uh, power management, of course, throughout the chip, turn off everything that's not being used as much as possible, and uh, and then for a lot of these devices, the duty cycle is pretty low. They just wake up. Uh, briefly do something and then go back to sleep for a long time. So, uh, so you're really focused on what is the power drain in that deep sleep mode. Uh, you, you have to minimize your leakage power, uh, which can really kill you in that sleep mode. And then, uh, you know, what what is the minimum power that you need in order to just retain state and then wait for an interrupt to wake up. So, really focusing on uh, keeping the power down. Security is is a big problem. Um, so, uh, you need to focus on, um, you know, several areas. I mean, the data, you want to make sure the data is secure while you're transmitting it, particularly with a wireless network. Um, you know, you don't want that data to be intercepted, you know, wirelessly. So, uh, so you need to have encryption, of course, uh, as you're transmitting your data. Um, you also need to make sure the data is secure when it's being stored. Uh, that's normally, you know, in the cloud. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's more on the cloud service provider to, to take precautions. And then you want to make sure that people can't hack into your IoT device, take control of you, you, your car, your oven, your door lock, whatever it is. Um, you know, so, so making sure that you uh, have secure boot uh, capability built in, uh, validate your boot code before you execute it, um, make sure you have secure storage on the chip uh, for any cryptography keys, uh, so that those can't be uh, hacked out. Uh, make sure that as uh, uh, commands are coming in, that you authenticate to make sure that these are um, uh, commands that are coming from an uh, authorized source. And you know, I, I think another good safety is, is just make sure that your system won't do something that's not safe. Um, you know, I was reading about uh, someone had figured out how to hack into uh, an insulin pump. That's, you know, people have insulin pumps now inserted. Uh, into their bodies, and they figured out, wow, I can hack into the insulin pump, and I can send it a command to dump all the insulin into the body at one time. And I thought, well, why would your insulin pump even allow you to do that? Right? I mean, it should know not to exceed a safe dosage. So I think, you know, if you're designing an IoT system, you have to think about things like that and just make sure that uh, the software is not going to do something that's inherently unsafe. So, so there's a lot of levels to security, and um, you know, I think uh, the designers have to be concerned about security from you know the very beginning of the design. Um, there's a lot of different wireless standards. I've mentioned several already uh, throughout the course uh, this morning. Uh, you can't cover all of the IoT applications with a single standard. So, um, so you need to decide which one is the best uh, for your particular application. Uh, cellular is, is good uh, if you have a mobile device that covers a lot of area, or if you're not sure where your device is going to be installed, uh, cellular is probably going to work just about anywhere. Um, but, uh, but you may have to pay some sort of monthly data fee. So Wi-Fi is great uh, because it's free uh, in most homes. Um, so if you're putting a device into uh, a home or a small business where you can count on having Wi-Fi, you know, that may be the best approach. Uh, Bluetooth, though, uses less power than Wi-Fi, uh, so that uh, if you're worried about power, you may want to look at something like Bluetooth uh, or uh, the, the 802.15.4 family of, of uh, protocols, uh, which are really very simple, uh, designed to be implemented at, at low cost and low power, so, uh, and then they also support mesh networks, 
So uh, that may be a good way to go, but then you, you have to figure out uh, you know, where uh, that signal is going to be received because not all uh, gateways support all of these uh, 802.15.4 protocols. Um, you can even use a proprietary protocol um, and then this is most appropriate if you have uh, a system that you're putting into a house, say for example, uh, you're going to put in a bunch of smoke alarms and they all connect to some central console. Uh, I know all the smoke alarms are going to be installed at once. They can all use my proprietary protocol to connect to my console and um, that, uh, you know, that doesn't have to be a standard protocol. And then if the customer has to add more smoke detectors later, now they have to come back to my company and buy those because it's a proprietary protocol. So I think the, the vendors like this idea because it creates some lock-in. It may not be the best thing for the consumer though. Uh, and then, uh, you know, so I think we are going to see uh, a lot of this proprietary uh, deployment over time. Um, and uh, a mixture of, of some of these different protocols. You know, hopefully the market settles out at some point and uh, ideally we have something like we have with Wi-Fi today that's very ubiquitous, but um, certainly in the, in the near term, I think we're gonna see a lot of you know, different protocols and, and a lack of interoperability. These are a couple of newer standards that are coming out I wanted to, to point to uh, that offer some, some opportunities uh, for convergence in the future. Uh, 802.11ah is the next generation Wi-Fi, and uh, one of the focuses of the AH working group has been to offer this this low power mode. So, um, in in addition to uh, adding the 900 megahertz band, which gives you better range, um, you have some new options to use uh, uh, smaller channels, one megahertz, two megahertz channels, so that uh, with these smaller channels, of course, uh, use less power. Um, and then uh, changing some of the protocol uh, itself to reduce power and uh, not, uh, you know, for example, Wi-Fi devices uh, have to check in periodically and that kind of wastes power, so now they're trying to get rid of that. Um, so, so all of these uh, options are now trying to bring the Wi-Fi power down really more toward where Bluetooth is and, uh, and make uh, this more ubiquitous. Um, where any Wi-Fi access point that supports 11AH will now support these, these low power options. So uh, we're already seeing uh, progress there. The draft standard is complete. Uh, we should see products uh, you know, on the market this year. So, uh, so there's uh, a lot of work being done there. Um, for cellular, a uh, similar thing is going on with uh, LTE uh, called Category Zero. And the idea is to uh, you know, reduce the data rate, reduce the uh, amount of, of uh, bandwidth that's being used, and then um, not only reduce power, but make the modem much simpler. So uh, today, you know, if you buy an LTE chip, it's probably designed to run at 150 megabits per second, or maybe 300 megabits per second, so you, it's got a lot of hardware in there to do all that. So if you limit the data rate to say one megabit per second, then all of a sudden the, the amount of processing is much smaller. So. Uh, so this, this standard uh, is also uh, in, uh, in a final approval process. Uh, there's actually some products that are already available that are sort of pre-standard products. And, uh, and then there's continuing work being done uh, in release 13 to uh, help uh, reduce costs even further uh, by integrating the power amplifier. So, uh, so a lot of focus now on, on making things easier you know, for uh, these IoT devices. So um, to wrap up, uh, uh, you know, a few big picture thoughts. Um, you know, there's just a lot of IoT platforms out there today. When I say platforms, I mean we're seeing all these things from uh, different companies pushing their own uh, kind of products. You know, there's there's all seen from Qualcomm, Embed, from ARM, uh, Azure, Arctic, all this different stuff, and and. You know, they're trying to uh, define a standard that people can use, but now you've got so many standards that nothing is really standard anymore. And, uh, you know, really what these uh, groups are trying to focus people on is, is, you know, usually using their chip, but also really using their cloud service. Uh, a lot of money is going to be made on these cloud services, and I think uh, that's really where the battle is being fought right now, is trying to get people locked into a cloud service. So you've got these, these you know, different groups now that are being driven by particular companies, and you've got some industry groups, a lot of different groups uh, that are battling to get the IoT uh, people on their side. Um, so, um, 
So I think that, you know, hopefully this will all uh, winnow down over time and we'll, we'll have a few good standards, a few good uh, groups uh, that, uh, that we can rally around and uh, that will really simplify things. But right now it's, it's very confusing to understand which platform you should develop. Uh, okay, so I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about our forecast. Um, the, you know, there's been a lot of numbers being thrown around, and uh, the uh, you know the 50 billion number is, is is very popular. This is something Cisco came up with, I think, about a year ago. And uh, you know, if you really look at what they what they're talking about, first of all, they're including everything that's connected to the internet. A PC, a smartphone, whatever. So, I mean, when you say you know 15 billion internet devices, you know today, 2014, 2015, um, you know that that's mostly PCs and smartphones. Um, and then, you know, in terms of forward projection, um, from uh, what they said, uh, somebody estimated how many things there are in the world. I don't know what that means. And then said, okay, 2.7% uh, of all things are connected to the internet. And hey, it happens to come out to 50.1 billion. <laughs> I think that's about how much thought was put into this forecast. Um, so, you know, we've tried to do something a little more sophisticated. Um, and, you know, all of the different target markets I talked about earlier, uh, looked at, you know, how big are these target markets, you know, how many farms are there in the world, how many acres do they have, how many buildings are there in the world, how many square feet do they have, how many sensors do I need to cover all of that, you know, how many consumers are there in the world that have Wi-Fi in their house so that I can actually connect an Internet of Things device, you know, how many ovens are sold, how many cars are sold, how many refrigerators are sold. Um, how, what percent of those are going to have uh, internet connectivity over the next five years, say. So, um, so try to put all that together and, um, you know, this is the forecast uh, we came up with. Uh, you know, what, uh, you know, a few things to notice, um, you know, of course the top line is, is a lot smaller than the numbers are getting thrown around. Um, you know, we still see uh, almost 2 billion IoT devices sold in 2020, so this is not a small market to sneeze at. And, and again, I mean, we're only counting uh, these incremental kind of new applications. There's no smartphones in here, there's no uh, set-top boxes, there's no digital TVs, there's no uh, disc players. Um, you know, these are, these are smart meters, these are uh, connected cars, these are smart appliances. Uh, you know, th these are true IoT devices. Um, so, so there, there is a, a market coming here. Um, you know, by by 2023, we project it being uh, bigger than the smartphone market. So, you know, that's uh, uh, pretty good. Uh, where we are today, the red area is the industrial applications. So, we're mostly seeing deployment in industrial smart meters, things like that. But um, uh, we do see an opportunity over the next few years for a lot of growth in the consumer space and eventually the consumer space is going to dominate. I mean, there's just m more consumers than there are industrial facilities. So, um, you know, as assuming that uh, there's a use case out there, um, consumer adoption typically follows an S-curve as, as uh, the uh, devices come out, uh, the early adopters get on, but then as, as the uh, use case becomes compelling, there's a big ramp, and then uh, and then things settle down once the market gets more saturated. So so we see that S curve happening 2017, 2018, big ramp in consumer, and then after that uh, the market is sort of growing uh, because uh, the number of uh, people in the global middle class is growing uh, fairly rapidly over time. But uh, you know, and then. If there's new use cases that, that we don't have in our chart, I mean, this could keep going up. But at least this is a, you know, I call this a conservative forecast because it's based on, you know, actual applications that, you know, we can foresee at this point in time. Now, um, how does that compare with the 50 billion? Well, I mean, I'd actually say uh, our 1.9 billion is really 18.5 billion because what most people are talking about is installed base. So, um, so if you add up all the units that are shipping into an installed base, of course, the numbers pile up much more quickly. So this is, you know, um, uh, our forecast um, in, in, with, uh, in, in terms of installed base. And then um, a lot of these other forecasts also include 
you know, PCs, smartphones, and tablets, and everything else. So I, I pile those on top of, you know, our numbers for IoT, and then, you know, if I, if I play all those games, I can get up to, you know, 18 billion uh, in 2020. So, you know, that's uh, a, a lot closer to the 50 billion number, it's still lower, but, um, you know, so then, um, you know, and I also put IDC's number on here, which is 28 billion. I'm seeing more forecasts now in that, in that 20 to 30 billion range. So, you know, uh, we're not that far off from, from these other forecasts, but um, I think we are, you know, more conservative in terms of just trying to look at, at uh, applications that, that we think are likely to be addressed in the next few years. So, you know, what's really driving IoT, uh, you know, the, the big picture here to me, you know, it's not really um, saving time. I mean, when you look at smart meters, um, you know, people say, oh, well, now we don't have to go out and read the meter. Well, it costs less than a dollar a month to read a meter for having a, a person out there running around. So what the big win for a smart meter is really allowing the utility to manage their grid better because now they have instantaneous data from thousands and thousands of meters. And uh, so, so the, the real win here is, is from the data. The, the data allows you to do things you couldn't do before and, and ultimately uh, save money. And so, you know, the questions I would ask, you know, looking at uh, different IoT devices is, um, you know, does your device generate big data? Um, you know, that, that could be where the value is coming from. And then if it does, what is the value of that data? Um, you know, are you helping your customers save money? Are you helping them manage their supply chain? Are you helping uh, generate ads that uh, advertisers can now target? Um, you know, if you can do things like that, now you can really generate a lot of value uh, that justifies your system. So, you know, for example, you know, smart thermostats, are, um, you, you know, they can program themselves great. I mean, I can program my thermostat pretty quickly, but, you know, if you can generate enough data to really allow people to uh, adjust their energy use, you know, that's, uh, that's a big win. Uh, smart lighting, I mean, you know, I, I don't have to get up off my couch to turn my lights on. I'm not sure that's really exciting. Um, so, you know, how do you use these in a way that generates data that generates energy savings? You know, farmers, uh, smart farms, I mean, you can already go out and check your soil to see if it needs fertilizer or water. Um, you know, is, is getting that data in real time from all over your field, is that really compelling enough to, uh, you know, save enough costs to justify deploying that? I mean, that's the real question is, you know, how, how is the value of that data? So, I mean, these, these are the kinds of questions I think people have to answer when they're looking at these IoT applications and, and say, is this really going to be useful or not? So, uh, we're going to be talking a lot more about these things uh, for the rest of the day. Uh, this morning, we're going to be talking about IoT processor design. Uh, we've got uh, talked on wireless technology, IC process technology for IoT, CPU cores. Um, we've got a new product announcement that's coming up uh, shortly. Uh, at lunch, uh, as I mentioned, we'll have uh, the opportunity to, to meet the speakers, talk to the speakers, uh, just look for the signs on the tables. Um, this afternoon, uh, we're going to have a session on security, always a hot topic for IoT, and uh, we'll have another new product uh, being announced in the security session this afternoon. And then uh, uh, we'll be talking about low power design uh, the, uh, later this afternoon, uh, another uh, very important topic for IoT and uh, talk about some technologies that will help uh, reduce power. So, and then uh, please uh, stay for our big reception uh, this evening. Uh, we'll have lots of food, uh, open bar. Uh, we'll have uh, giveaways uh, for uh, people that uh, you can win. So, uh, so uh, don't forget to, uh, to stay for that. So just uh, to summarize uh, my presentation, uh, you know, IoT brings new capabilities to uh, a lot of existing systems and uh, mostly just through adding a wireless uh, connection allows you to uh, do a lot of new things. Uh, today we're seeing a lot of interest in the industrial IoT, but uh, we believe that in the long, longer term, uh, the big, biggest opportunity is in the consumer, uh, consumer IoT. But in order to get there, we really need to focus on reducing system costs. Uh, one way that we can reduce system costs is through uh, integration and uh, we'll be, be talking a lot today about how do you integrate these processors uh, to reduce system costs. 
Uh, security and low power are, are critical to, to drive the IoT forward. We're going to be talking about that today. And, uh, you know, we really think that, you know, there is a big opportunity here in the IoT, maybe not as big as, as some people say, but, uh, but there is a real opportunity here. So, um, with that, um, I think I'm, do I have time for questions? Okay, um, I'm going to take a couple questions if we have any. Question up here, hold just a second until we get the microphone. Um, so I was interested in, uh, I think you said on Foil 26, uh, the IoT forecast, uh, you said consumers is going to be the, the largest market, but that's in terms of the units. Does that picture change when you start applying dollars to that picture? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think, uh, you know, we, we've done some studies on revenue as well. Um, the, uh, in the industrial IoT, there are opportunities for higher, higher prices, um, uh, but I think that the same technologies that are driving down costs in consumer will also drive down costs in, in the industrial deployment. And so, you know, while there will be higher ASPs there, they're not going to be, you know, so much higher. Uh, but uh, I think, you know, both markets are going to be pretty strong. I think, you know, from the, from the graph, um, you can see there's a lot of units in both places. But uh, I think it's a good point that, you know, revenue-wise, the gap is going to be smaller. Also, thank you very much for your great show on the CCN industries. But so far, whenever I just attend the last of IoT conference, most of people are trying to explain their view as a manufacturer point of view. But I, I would like to know what about the customer side or some service provider side? Because even they manufacture make a last of IoT device, eventually, it should be installed by service providers like Verizon or some, <coughs> some cable network maker or even some end customer like themselves. But consumer wise, at least commercial but customer wise, generally, if since they are always uh, looking for free of the child service, <coughs> I'm not sure how they can make a business model for. Consumer, but industrial case definitely they have a lot of so specific men that it might be easier than some mm -hmm. consumer. But I wish to know what kind of your vision for that kind of yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I think um, yeah, for for the industrial applications, you know, as as you said, it's it's, it's it comes out of business case. I think for consumers, it is it is trickier, and um, you know, particularly for the wearables. Right, I talked about, uh, you know, you need a, a good use case and you need a, a good user interface, right, that makes it easy to use. I think for some of the other applications, um, you know, again, I, I think for the, these to take off, I mean, you need some kind of compelling use case. Um, you know, I, I can see, you know, a pretty good use case for some of these. I mean, um, you know, if I can uh, uh, be able to monitor my house when I'm not there, uh, somebody comes to the door. I can I can see who they are. Do I do I need to let them in because they're a repair person, or you know I don't want to let them in. <coughs> you know I, I think I would pay money for that. I'm not sure how much money I'd pay, right? So I think that's where the cost has to come down. But um, I, I think there are some some good use cases you know for these consumer devices. But um, you know it it does come down to uh, putting together some combination of of features and and also. Um, you make it easy, easy to install and easy to use before you're going to get uh, a lot of uh, uptake from consumers. That's going to be the toughest market. Okay, one more question, B. Uh, one more question. Yeah. So my question is uh, more. I looked at your um, thoughts and your forecast on the different areas of industrial and consumer. And what jumps out to me is there's a great deal of focus on wireless connectivity. What are, what are your thoughts and what do you see in terms of quiet connectivity from an IoT both in industrial, commercial, and home? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I mean, there are some opportunities for wired connectivity. Um, you know, certainly in uh, industrial settings, um, we may see more, you know, Ethernet because I've already got, you know, some Ethernet around. Um, and, uh, but, you know, certainly in the <coughs> consumer side, uh, you know, there's not a lot of wired connectivity in typical homes. 
Um, so we see that being almost entirely wireless. Uh, even on the industrial side, I think there's more of a push toward um, making these devices easy to install. Um, you know, if I, if I need to put sensors all over my factory, uh, let's say, you know, I've got to put them, but can I just use wireless ones and then I don't have to worry about it. So I think, um, you know, as people are installing these, even in industrial environments in a lot of cases, it, it ends up being cheaper now to, to use uh, a, a wireless connectivity. Okay. Um, uh, all right, fine, we'll give you one more. Sorry about that, this guy, Bola. What do you envision in uh, automotive, automotive application of how uh, I would see like vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, vehicle to itself is a uh, combination of the sensor, the network, gateway, to the infrastructure, how it is a lot thing. Yeah, I mean, uh, so, so, so certainly, you know, we've included automotive in our forecast. I think uh, I'm assuming about 60% uh, of vehicles will have some sort of connectivity by 2020. Um, there seems to be a lot of momentum there. Um, not entirely sure where the applications are. I think even the automakers are trying to figure that out. Um, tracking the vehicle is certainly a big one. Uh, being able to offer uh, emergency services. Is, is a big one. Um, the uh, the vehicle to vehicle thing. I mean, it, it still fits in with the whole autonomous car, and you know whether we need vehicle to vehicle or if it's vehicle to infrastructure. Um, you know, it's still not really determined very well. Um, and then you know, people want to be able to you know offer infotainment services in the car uh, through that connection uh, connectivity. So I, I think uh, you know there, there's still a lot of uh, experimentation there uh, that, that's going on, but, but uh, there does seem to be a, a pretty strong drive toward, you know, the connected car. Uh, 